Welcome to Scary Stories. We've got over two hours of Dogman for you, starting right now with this all new tale that we call Does Dogman Work for Alien Intelligence? Dear Scary Stories NYC, I want to ask you outright Do you get stories from people saying that they think Dogman is somehow associated with government interests or something weird along those lines? Because I've got this story about my wife that just came to a head last night when I accidentally saw her with what had to be the Dogman, only that creature was not what I was expecting it to be. For starters, my wife Franny used to be a real free thinker. But that stopped around, I don't know, seven, eight years ago when she started believing TV instead of her senses and logic. That was also the year we moved to Wisconsin and she had her first encounter with the Dogman. It was autumn of 2016 and when my wife came home to tell me that she had met a dog-headed animal man who spoke to her telepathically, well, it made as much sense as anything else she was saying that year. That was the year she became the opposite of whatever she had been before. Except she was still my wife, and I still loved her, even if she no longer had any of her own opinions. My view of it was that she had devolved into a brainwashed lemming, and I thought the stories of the dogman that she told me were signs that she had lost touch with reality completely. And now, I think those stories were a key to the origins of her brainwashing. Like I said, I saw her last night, and she really was with a dogman. He looked like a wolf, but he moved like a human. They were in the woods behind our neighbor's house when I saw them. Then they were both sitting on the hard, cold ground facing each other. Only that dogman wasn't a wise shamanic soul speaking to her telepathically as she had always reported to me. He was clearly holding some small electronic device up in front of her face and it had a bright light on it. My wife was looking diagonally off from the creature and his handheld light. And judging by the ever-changing emotions on her face, she was seeing things that I could not see. And I didn't understand what I was seeing. I didn't know what that creature was. And I didn't know what the device was that he was holding either. To be honest, he might have been a human in a furry costume. who would have had to have been a top-notch, very realistic-looking one. But that doesn't mean it wasn't a suit. On the other hand, it could have been a real, living, upright canine that I was looking at. In which case, where did that creature come from? It had to be intelligent. It had my wife in a trance. And once you know there is a creature in your neighborhood who can cause you to think you're seeing things that you aren't actually seeing, how do you continue to navigate sanely through life? You might be seeing things that look absolutely real to you, which might only be ideas or visuals implanted in your mind by these dogmen, whatever they are. Maybe they're aliens. Maybe they're from a parallel reality. Maybe they're government agents. I just don't know. Maybe they only work for others who are from the other side. Or from large corporations. Or, you know, I don't know. I can only take wild guesses. And I'm afraid to look too deeply into it. For the reason that I don't want to become a programmed victim like my wife seems to have become. All her ideas are so drastically different from the worldview of the woman I married. And she's so angry and intolerant these days. You can't even remind her that her opinions once matched mine. That will induce a rage unlike any which I ever saw from her before. At least before everything went sour. I mean, it might already be too late for me. I told you about seeing her being programmed by the Dogman. But I honestly can't recall what happened next. Did I go home? Did I confront them? I just can't remember. Are there other things disguising themselves as dogmen? Or are dogmen more than just feral carnivorous cryptids? One thing I know for sure now is that they are not something made up by my wife, as I have been figuring. And that raises the possibility that that thing has been the one controlling my wife and making her crazy for years now. Oh, this makes me wonder if I'm the insane one. And if you tell me I've lost the plot, I think I'd actually feel a little relieved. Until then, though, I have to concern myself with the terrifying possibility that I am not imagining all this. And the implications of that, if even part of it's true, are too much for me to accept. 
So I'm hoping you or your viewers have an easy explanation to let me know why this isn't something I really need to worry about. Explain to me why none of this is a problem in the real world. Until then, I'm going to keep asking myself, does Dogman work for alien intelligence? Crazy Dogman caused a blackout or the Beast of Bedford, PA. Dear Scary Stories NYC, a close friend of mine was with his adult son driving in western Pennsylvania back in early 2021 when a creature they told me looked like a dog-headed werewolf cut out in front of their car unexpectedly on the turnpike at night. When I pressed them for details about what they saw, very little which they said surprised me. This was a classic modern upright dogman sighting other than one strange detail which I will get to. The creature had a canine head with his ears on top of his head. A long snout combined his nose and dog mouth into one dangerous toothsome feature and a fur covered body which looked very humanoid when he was up on his hind legs and running. The other thing that caused him to look humanoid was the fact that his paws were clearly capable of gripping and holding objects in the same way that human hands can. What I mean by that is that the beast was carrying some kind of metal rod in his hand or paw. And he was looking back over his shoulder as if he were being chased by something he was deathly afraid of. My friend's son, who was driving, swerved around the beast, and as they were to the immediate right of it, the metal rod that the creature was holding got struck directly by a bolt of lightning. The sound of the lightning landing directly to the side of the car was so loud that the two of them went deaf for quite a while and experienced a harsh ringing sound for over a day afterward. My friend could clearly see the lightning striking that beast man and the metal rod he carried, even with his eyes squeezed shut. That's how brightly lit that scene was. I wish I could tell you more than that, but my friend's son kept driving, no matter how semi-blinded and largely deafened he had been by the incident. He was too afraid to stop his car, too afraid of what was back there. I wanted to know what that dog man was running from, but whatever it had been, the humans were running from it as well. I tried to imagine that. Whatever it was that was so scary, even the Pennsylvania dog man was afraid of it. You know, I literally can't even imagine what could possibly be that scary. If you have a guess, please pass it on to me because I've got no clue on that one. But you know, this all reminded me of my own family's Pennsylvania Dogman experience, which happened decades and decades before the one I just described. The overlap, I think, between the two stories is the way that in both cases, the Dogman's behavior is beyond unpredictable. Is this only a trait of the Pennsylvania Dogman? Or is this common to all upright walking canines? There is a town in the south central part of Pennsylvania called Bedford. And a few generations back, my family used to live in a house on a hill just outside of that town. The hill is still there, but the house no longer is. This was because of an electrical fire that destroyed it and some of the woods around it, while causing a short blackout in the immediate area around the home. According to family legend, the blackout was caused not by an accident or by an act of God, but rather by a particularly mischievous, some might even say crazy, dogman. I was told this story when I was a kid, not as a bedtime or cautionary tale, but as something that had supposedly really happened. This was our father's side of the family, but I lost my dad when I was very young. My mother and I first heard this story at the same time from my uncle, her brother-in-law. In fact, he took us driving over to the area, which was really nice in that era. I imagine it must still be a nice place to live. 
He wasn't sure about the exact location of the house, so I am not either. He thought it was either on Forbes Road over there just out of town, or else on a road that might only be a path through the woods by now. We never got out of the car to search. We just drove through to get a general idea of the place that he was talking about. My dad and his brother were fraternal twins, both born in 1935, by which time his family lived closer to Pittsburgh. When his father, my grandfather, was a boy, he lived in this house in question outside of Bedford, up on that forested hillside. So I guess we're probably talking about 1915 to 1920, when this story is supposed to have taken place. My grandpa's name was Joseph, and when little Joey was a kid, his house was haunted by a large nuisance animal that they either called the Beast of Bedford when they were being fancy, or just the monster when they were using shorthand. They didn't use a word like dogman or wolfman or werewolf to describe it, but it was supposed to have had a dog's head and been covered in fur like an animal. This was an upright creature, though. It did not crawl on the ground. It walked upright in the same way that you or I do. Although the family business was not farming, they had a small farm which they maintained. There was a goat which they milked, and there were chickens and a small backyard-sized farm with a few different crops on it. They ate what they grew. They didn't farm enough to sell any of the food off. This farm supplemented the family income. It was not the entirety of it. The first time they saw the creature I'm just going to call a dogman was when it broke into the hen house and ran off with one of the chickens. It was seen by several of the family members as it made its getaway. My uncle said it was the size of a fully grown man, so maybe that means six feet tall. Then he said it was as fast as an Olympic sprinter with that chicken tucked under his arm. When I was a kid, I was really into monsters, and I used to like to draw them. For this reason, I quizzed my uncle on what the dogman was supposed to have looked like. I tried to sort of do a witness drawing based on his description, which I unfortunately lost years ago. I can give you the description itself pretty well from my memory, though. It was a brown dog that stood and walked like a man. I asked him if it had hands, and my uncle just looked confused. He said, dogs have paws, kid, not hands. But there are points in his stories where the dog does things that seem to imply that he had more manual dexterity than your average canine. Like when he tucked a chicken under his arm and ran like it was a football. How many dogs have you ever seen doing that? So I'm guessing that maybe the dog man had large paws that enabled him to do things that most dogs could not. When I asked about the hind legs and if they looked like the legs of a dog or legs of a man. Again, I utterly baffled my uncle. He said the legs looked like legs, which didn't help me with making my drawing. So again, I'm going to guess and say that maybe its hind legs look like the hind legs of a normal dog, yet he managed to stand upright on them anyhow. It's also possible that my uncle just never found out about those details. Maybe he just filled in the blanks in his own head when he first heard the story in his youth. So basically he was supposed to look like a dog, but he stood like a man. Make of that what you will. My witness drawing was messy, with a lot of erasing and redrawing. Yet at the end my uncle still said, No, no, you're not listening to me, kid. One detail I can remember for sure that my uncle described was orange eyes. Bright orange eyes was the way he put it. These days, people speak of glowing amber or orange eyes on modern dogmen. So to me, that lends a little bit of credibility to the idea that a dogman is exactly what we are talking about here, a Pennsylvania dogman. So the family project became protecting the animals. A new barn was built for the goat. And I think they may have had a horse or a mule or something along those lines. The building was double reinforced and locked up for the overnights. 
even though the dogman had not actually made an attack on those creatures. At least, not yet. The family didn't feel they could afford to lose either animal, so their home was reinforced along with the chicken coop. My uncle said that the coop was reinforced with a few layers of wired meshing, interwoven into a new iron grid fence. The top was covered with several layers of the wiring and surrounded with barbed wire. The single entrance was now held in place by a bolt with a key lock. The key itself was kept inside the house at night. And this ended the first reign of terror that the dogman had perpetrated on the family. He never stole another animal from them ever again. Well, not for a long time. The damn part of all this was that the dogman seemed to take all of this personally. And although their animals were now safe, a new series of problems emerged. From then on, that house was haunted by that dogman. He would climb up the side of the building to stare into your window at night with his bright orange eyes. If you were sleeping, he'd tap on the glass until you woke up to see him. The family knew he'd also been up on the roof because the tiles seemed to be falling off at a far greater rate than usual. It was hard to understand how the animal had so much free time to waste bothering them, especially if there was no way for him to get any food from them anymore. Shouldn't that have been enough to make him find some other place to haunt? Instead, they started to see him even more frequently than before, and he seemed to enjoy breaking something with each visit. The dogman became most notorious to the mailmen, and my family's house had a long succession of those. The dogman enjoyed knocking our mailbox off its wooden post and onto the path leading up to our front door. But that was kind compared to the things he tried to do to the mailmen themselves. He seemed to take a front at the idea of us receiving any kind of message from the outside world at all. Initially, the dogman would secrete himself on the property and wait for the postman to arrive. Then he'd pick the moment when the poor guy was at his most vulnerable, and that creature would spring out of the shadows, making straight for the mailman's softer parts. He would chase their truck away, up to the streetlight at the end of the county road. After he got more used to the mail delivery schedule, the dogman would sometimes intercept that mailman a half mile or more up the road. By then, he wasn't just preventing my family from getting our mail, but several other families as well. The route was auctioned off to the public to run on behalf of the Postal Service, but none of those people had any better luck than the others it had with that dogman. Eventually, the post office just had to hold our mail and have my family just come pick it up themselves. The dogman seemed to be okay with that arrangement. The creature man didn't have any special hatred for mail carriers, though. He seemed to dislike all visitors equally. There are stories of the dogman chasing kids away on their bicycles, old men in their horse and buggies, and once even a young man on horseback. No matter how fast the animal or means of conveyance, the dogman proved itself quick enough to chase them away and keep them too frightened to attempt a return trip. He wasn't exactly the friendliest of God's creatures, but he certainly was efficient and he was thorough. Traffic in the area as a consequence was sparse, and it was kept that way too. There was one story about the dogman that made very little sense to me. He was accused, it seems, of tunneling underground and somehow ruining crops that way. To me, that sounds like someone's crops failed and they made up a wild story about it to blame it all on the dogman. But I've never been a farmer, and I don't know anything about the dogman except for what I hear. Maybe the dogman was robbing the crops from underground tunnels, but it seems to me that the last I heard, this was a meat-eating creature, not a giant feral rabbit. Again, what do I know? Nothing. That's what I know. Anyway, the family used to have little lights outside both the front and back doors, but the dogman broke them so many times that they eventually stopped fixing them. He never broke any of the windows, although he certainly could have. What he would do 
was put long, deep scratches into the glass, making them harder and harder to see out of over time. America was getting wired for electricity in the early 20th century, with the biggest boom coming between 1920 and 1935. According to my uncle, the family went electric at some point in part to scare off the dogman. Apparently, for a while, there was an electric fence erected around the property that they were hoping would eliminate the troubles constantly being caused by that dogman. What happened instead was that pretty much every animal except the dogman in the area ran into that fence and lost the battle. The fence got turned off, and soon the dogman was back, scratching on the windows, tapping on the doors, and still trying to get past that barbed wire into the chicken coop. Then, one night, the electricity seemed to flicker inside the house, and little Grandpa Joey was sent outside by his father to try to see what was going on. Well, Grandpa Joey went out into the dark night and heard the sounds of electrical sparking coming from behind the house. When he got back there, he looked up onto the roof, and there was that dogman pulling at the electrical connection to the house. That would be the connection from the street, from the main power grid, to the house itself, which I would think would carry enough power to kill an elephant. The dogman was playing with live wires as though they were doggy toys. He licked the wires to taste them, then he tugged at them with his paws. He kept giving himself shock after shock, causing his fur to stand on end all over his body and for smoke to occasionally emanate from his proximity. The creature's eyes were lit up like light bulbs, and he vibrated in various frequencies all at once. Sparks and little lightning bolt things were crackling all around, and each time something would spark up in its immediate vicinity, the dogman would act surprised and pull back for a second, but then he'd be going right back at it as soon as the fire at the ends of his fingertips went out. In fact, he was smoking from various places on his body. And yet that curious dogman just kept playing with the high-tension wire like there was nothing else to do. Since he was supposed to have been lit up clearly at this point in the story, I asked what he looked like in that better lighting. I don't know if my uncle answered honestly or just made something up to quiet me down, but I was told that he was light brown in color and that he was the size of a tall but thin man. He wasn't a muscle man dogman but he was like a man with a dog head. He behaved like a thinking creature, just one that thought mischievous and annoying thoughts, which caused trouble for everyone around him. And this time his playful spirit had shut down the family's power and might be about to electrocute that dog man himself next. So Grandpa Joey started taking rocks from the ground and flinging them up on the roof at the dog man, trying to get him to stop playing with that wire. He shouted at the dogman, and that attracted Joey's father and brother to come out of the house. Seeing that he was now outnumbered, the dogman grew nervous and got up to run away. When he did, he pulled on the electrical wire and caused an explosion that blew up that corner of the house and sent sparks and flames in every direction. The dogman slammed to the ground along with the family. And even the lawn itself was in flames. There was an attempt made to put out the fire which only made it worse due to the family not understanding the nature of electrical fires. The house was abandoned and the animals were either rescued in the case of the four-legged ones in the stable or set free in the case of the chickens. Seeing this, the dogman grabbed a couple of birds and sped off. The family had too much on their hands to chase him. When Grandpa Joey ran to a neighbor's house, he found that the electricity was down in the entire area, but their telephone seemed to work. He called the fire department, but nothing was able to be salvaged from the house besides the horse and the goat. There were places the family could have moved nearby, but they felt that they would need to make a move of a greater distance, otherwise that dogman was only going to keep coming back 
Japan bothering them over and over again. There was no keeping him out, and there was no end to the destructive things that he could do. I don't think he meant to blow up the house. I think he was just being a jerk and a brat. He did want to bother the family until he got food from them, but he wrecked their lives and forced them to leave the region instead. Then again, maybe he really did mean to be so malicious after all. It's hard to say, really, especially all these years later. I tell you, if time travel suddenly became a possibility, the one moment in history that I would want to go back to see would be the time that... The crazy beast of Bedford Dogman caused a blackout. He's come again, both Alina and Mina. The king returns. It's Jason Regina. Please join me in welcoming back the once and future king, Jason Regina. Jason gets to see our weekly Sunday secret uncensored members only stories. And so can you. The Dogman Club. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have created a club for people who I've met who have seen the Dogman. But the only way you can get in the club is if you've never publicly reported your sighting or experience. What bonds us together as friends is our guilt at not being honest about what we saw. Some of us might have prevented the dogman doing terrible things if we had sent out an alarm. But we each have our own cowardly reason for not having done the right thing. And that guilt bonds us tighter than super glue to each other. We are all admittedly weak people who would like to find a way together to become a positive force for change and acceptance. That Dogman is a real thing in the real world. I'd like to share with you a short story about the Dogman that I wrote when I was a teenager. There's a point to this which I'll explain afterward, but let me tell you the story first. It's called The Poodle I Saved from Dogman. And I was 17 years old when I wrote this here masterpiece. Fasten your seatbelts. I wasn't the best writer in those days. The Poodle I Saved from the Dogman by me, age 17. I can't believe what I saw last night. It was like something out of a horror movie. I was walking home from my friend's house around midnight when I saw it. A 15-foot-tall dog-headed man monster was walking down the street and it was carrying something under its arm. I froze in fear and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The creature's body was like a man's body but covered in thick dog fur except for its giant dog head, sharp teeth, dog-like legs, and long claws. It was so tall that it had to bend down to see me. I don't know how I managed to muster up the courage, but I stared at it with wide eyes. And then, I slowly backed away. But the creature didn't seem to care about me, so I continued backing away until I turned around and ran back to my house. I locked the door and double-checked it before finally calming down enough to convince myself that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. But then the next day, we heard that our neighbor's poodle was missing. I couldn't shake the feeling that it had something to do with that monster that I had seen the previous night. I tried to brush it off and focus on my day, but I couldn't shake off the fear. When I arrived home from school that evening, my neighbor was outside with flyers of the missing dog. I approached her and asked if I could help in any way. She was grateful and handed me a stack of flyers to distribute around the neighborhood. As I walked around, I couldn't stop thinking about that creature that I had seen the previous night. Was it the one responsible for taking the poodle? The thought terrified me and I wished I had never seen it. It was heartbreaking to see how saddened my neighbor was. But then the next night, I saw the monster again, and once again I saw it holding the missing poodle under its hairy arm. It seemed to be walking toward a seemingly abandoned house 
that I had never noticed before. I knew I had to do something. I couldn't let that monster get away with stealing someone's pet. I approached the house, and I heard a faint yelping. It was coming from inside. I slowly crept around the side of the house, and to my surprise, there was an open window. I peeked inside and saw the monster in a room with the poodle. I was so close that I could see the tiny dog shivering in fear. I knew I had to act fast. I went around to the front of the house, and I kicked down the door, startling the monster in the process. It turned toward me, and I could see the rage and anger in its eyes. It was ready to attack. I didn't hesitate, and I ran toward it. We collided, and I was knocked to the ground. It was trying to bite and claw at me, but I fought back with all my might. It was a tough and intense fight that seemed to last forever. Finally, with one last blow, I knocked that creature out cold. I picked up the poodle, who was now trembling even harder, and I ran out of the house toward my own home. My neighbor was overjoyed to see her missing dog, and I was happy to reunite them. It wasn't until the next day that I realized the importance of what I had done. I had put myself in danger, but I saved someone's pet from being lost forever. That monster could have hurt someone if it hadn't been stopped. From that day on, I made a vow to always help when I can, even if it means putting myself in harm's way. The incident made me realize that we're all capable of doing good, even in the face of danger. And who knows, maybe one day, I'll be able to help someone else in need. Nice story, right? The only problem is, the entire thing is a lie. Well, not the beginning. It starts off true. And the part about seeing the monster holding something under its arm, that was true too. It was something about the size of the poodle that lived next door. But I couldn't see it clearly in the dark. And it was not moving, as in this story I wrote. The part about my neighbor crying over the loss of her dog, that was sure true also. I think that's why I still feel so guilty. I never fought the dog man. I hid from it. I didn't rescue that poodle, but I did see my neighbor weeping and handing out flyers. I was not her hero in any place except my imagination, and it gnawed at me for a long time. When I met some other people here in Michigan with similar backstories, we formed our own club. We call it the Dogman Club, and we're a sort of support group for each other, at least for now. Sometimes we meet in person, other times we meet online. We talk about possibly doing something positive, like going out and searching for the dogman. But at this stage, we are mainly focused on healing and coping with the trauma that the dogman has introduced into our lives. We all want to keep our names anonymous, but we really would like to share our separate stories so that you can understand our unified mission. Here's another confession from one of our other members. You may note some small overlaps between all our different stories. Let's call this one. State Forest Dogman. I remember the day when I saw the strangest creature walking in the Roscommon State Forest area. Walking in the Roscommon State Forest area. It was a sunny day and I was out hunting with my brothers, hoping to catch some wild game to bring back to our town. We were walking through a dense part of the forest when I saw something moving in the distance. At first I thought it might be a bear or a deer, but as it came closer, I realized it was something that I had never seen before. The creature was tall and walked on two legs, just like a man, but its body was covered in fur and it had a dog head. I couldn't believe my eyes as I watched it move effortlessly through the forest, not caring about our presence at all. It was like it owned those woods and was not afraid of any human being. I was intrigued and frightened at the same time. I had never seen anything like this before, and I didn't know what to make of it. 
I knew I had to tell my elders about what I'd seen, but I was hesitant because I knew they might think I was making up stories. When I returned to the res, I sought out my grandfather, who was a wise man and knew much about the natural world. I told him what I had seen, and I waited for his response. To my surprise, he did not dismiss my story or call me a liar. Instead, he listened carefully, and then he told me to sit down. And then he began to tell me a story about a creature that lived in the forest many years ago. The creature was known as Coyote, a spirit of the forest and a protector of secrets. It was said that Coyote would sometimes take the form of a dog-headed man and would walk through the forest, observing and protecting the land. My grandfather told me that it was possible that I had seen Coyote, and if so, that it was a good omen. Coyote was a powerful spirit, and seeing him meant that it was watching over me and my family. He also told me not to be afraid of the creature and to show it respect if I ever see it again. I was relieved to hear my grandfather's words, and it made me feel better about what I had experienced. I also began to understand that our people had a deep connection to the natural world and believed in spirits that protect and watch over us. As the years passed, I never saw that dog-headed man again, but I did hear stories from other people on the res who had seen it, and they were all of the opinion that it was a sign of protection and good luck. Each time I hear these stories, I am reminded of my encounter and the wisdom of my grandfather. Now, as an elder in my own right, I tell this story to others, hoping that it will bring them a sense of understanding and a connection to the land. I also tell it so that they will understand that our people had a strong belief in the natural world and the spirits that dwell within it. It is our responsibility to protect and respect the land, and in doing so, we will be shown great respect in return. I hope that this story will be passed down from generation to generation, reminding all of us of the wisdom, strength, and power of the natural world. The Car Crash That Saved My Life I remember waking up in a daze, the car completely wrecked, and the sounds of metal creaking and tires spinning in the air. Panic set in as I realized I couldn't move, and my vision seemed to be going dark around the edges. That's when I saw the beast, a huge, hairy, humanoid creature with a canine head. I was unable to move as I was locked in place as I saw this creature approaching me. The way the vehicle was wrecked, I was firmly locked in where I was. The dogman easily bent metal and whatever else to free me, and then it gently scooped me up in its massive arms, cradling me as it ran toward what seemed like an endless forest. I could only imagine the worst, that he was going to bring me to his lair and eat me. As unconsciousness overtook me, I remembered that there can be such things that are even worse than death. I remember bouncing up and down somewhat uncomfortably, having all sorts of dreams and hallucinations about what was jostling me around. Only some of them involved the big bad wolf carrying me high speed through a forest, heading toward an unknown destination. I blacked out once more, only to wake up in a strange hospital room with unfamiliar faces surrounding me. Then it hit me. The dog man had saved my life. Tears welled up in my eyes as I thought of how grateful I was to be alive and to this creature that had once terrified me, but had turned out to be my savior. As the days went by and I healed from my injuries, I couldn't stop thinking about the creature that had carried me to safety. I wanted to thank it, to tell it how much its actions had meant to me. I also felt guilty for assuming that it wanted to eat me, or worse. I wish I could make it up to the beast somehow, but it seemed that the dogman had disappeared back into the forest like some kind of mythical creature. Though others might not believe my story, I know the truth. I've been rescued by a beast that was as gentle as it was fierce, and it had shown me that sometimes 
things aren't always as they seem. When I was with him, I wanted to get away. Now that I know his noble nature, though, I wish I could meet him again, with me getting to do the favor for him the second time. This is why I joined the Dogman Club, to be a member who can see the Dogman side of things, to be a member who isn't so afraid of him as the others. I also want to prevent the others from treating him like he's a monster. Some of them are traumatized by what they've seen, and they can sometimes forget that the Dogman is a living thing too, with feelings and emotions, the same as you and me. He showed mercy to me. And I'm here to see he's treated with the basic humanity that the Dogman deserves to be treated with by the Dogman Club. The thing that my dog was barking at. I can still vividly recall the night that changed my life forever. It was a regular evening, or so I thought, until my dog started barking in this really weird way. He was going crazy, and I knew that something was not right. I took a flashlight and stepped out of the house, hoping to find the source of his distress. Which I did. There was a humanoid creature striding through the woods at the back of the yard, walking upright like a man, but with the head of a canine. It was massive, easily over seven feet tall, and covered in thick black fur. I remember being frozen with terror as it went past me, carrying a sleeping bag with what appeared to be an unconscious human inside, over his shoulder as though it were his bath towel. I knew immediately that I had witnessed something extraordinary, but also something dangerous. I stood there watching as the creature disappeared into the woods, my heart beating like a drum in my chest. I wasn't sure what to do. I knew I needed to tell everyone what I'd seen, but I knew that I would never tell anyone what I'd seen. The thing is, I didn't want to believe in myself. I tried to rationalize it as a trick of the light, but as the days went on, the images kept replaying in my mind. I knew that I had seen something that defied all explanation. It wasn't something I had imagined. It wasn't something I had dreamed. But still I kept quiet. I didn't report the sighting. I didn't tell my friends. I didn't even confide in my family. Because I was a coward. I was afraid. Afraid of what people would say. Afraid of the ridicule. Afraid of being dismissed as crazy. And so I lived with that fear. That guilt. For years. They say a brave man dies only once. While a foolish coward like me dies a million deaths every day. I have nothing to say in my own defense. I scanned the news for days afterward. Looking for a story about a lost female camper. But I found nothing. I have no idea who that woman was or what became of her. I sometimes tell myself that she must have gotten away. Once she got away, then there would be no more news story. So I told myself that the fact that none of this was reported in the papers at the time, that meant that she must have escaped the beast. I don't really believe that. But I tell it to myself sometimes in an effort to relieve the crushing guilt. The fear of being ridiculed had kept me silent for too long, and I knew that I needed to find a way to confront my fears and tell my story. It was only after connecting with other eyewitnesses who had seen similar creatures that I finally found the courage to speak about what I'd seen. It was a relief to finally share my story with others who had experienced something similar and who didn't judge me. Don't get me wrong, it's not like everything suddenly became easy after that. I still have moments where I doubt what I saw or feel fear or anxiety around it. But coming forward and being honest with myself and others was the first step in healing. I understand that many people will never believe me, and that's okay. But for me, it's not about convincing anyone else that what I saw was real. It's about accepting that it was real for me and learning to live with that truth. In the end, I know that I made the right decision in finally confessing what I saw. I may never truly rid myself of the fear and guilt that plagued me for so long, but at least now I can move forward with honesty and acceptance. Dogman driven into a rage by evil behavior.
My story is that I got pushed around a lot by kids in school. I used to get bullied by them on the school bus, too. So I took to walking home alone through a path in the woods that led up behind my house. One day those guys must have been bored or something because they found me walking home next to the woods and they started pushing me around with a greater vigor than ever before. I think it was because nobody else was around, but they seemed to be a lot angrier than usual, and they were throwing me around in a more frightening way than usual, too. I felt like these guys were giving off extremely bad vibes, evil vibes, not just school bully vibes as usual. They seemed like someone had turned them up to 11, as it were, and I don't think I was the only one to sense that intense evil scent or vibration or whatever it was. Because crash out of the woods came this big, weird, and scary looking canine. It was running out at us like a man. It was running out at us like a man. But when the bully furthest from the left took off running, the canine dropped to all fours and ran past me, almost knocking me down. His head was still a little above mine as he ran past and his back came right up to about my eye level. I don't honestly remember how tall I was back then, but I remember that this creature was too tall for me. So I think this was the dog man. I mean, I didn't get video or DNA evidence to prove it, but it was the biggest dog possible. And it was fast both went up on its hind legs or down on all fours, right? I think it was there because of the intense evil energy of those boys. That's not to say that I think the dog man was evil, in fact, I think he was there to attack the evil, really. And that's what he did, while I stood there and watched. Each time one of the kids tried to get away, he tore after them and herded them back, somewhat rudely. Extremely rudely, in fact. The boys kept trying to get away, but the dog kept playing whack-a-mole and maintaining his brutish stalemate. Once the boys seemed to be beginning to realize that they were in a pickle, the dogman reared back up onto his hind legs, and we all gasped. We had seen him at full height when he first crashed out, but it was somehow even more shocking the second time. He was like something out of a science fiction movie by Ray Harryhausen. That was what it was like to see him. Just then, a driver going by screeched to a halt and stared at me and the scene watching the dogman and those boys. I took off running into the woods, leaving the other boys to fend for themselves, and that driver beeped his horn loudly. I found out later that the dogman ran off when the driver honked his car horn, and then that driver drove the boys to the emergency room. I didn't understand how the driver didn't notice me running away, but I guess he might have been looking at the dog standing upright larger than a bear at the time. Now, I don't know why those bully boys never bothered me at school again. Maybe they thought the dog man was my friend, or that I was the one who called him over or something. Maybe they thought I was bad luck to mess with? I'd say maybe they just became better people, but does that really ever happen? When I saw them back at school, I actually tried to approach them and apologize for running away. I felt bad about what happened. They would always just leave when I would come near, though. They avoided me completely and I couldn't read the expressions on their faces. Because both the driver and the boys described the dogman as a large dog, there was a big anti-stray dog panic in the area following. For a while, my mother came to pick me up from school. Kids weren't allowed to walk around by the woods alone, and a bunch of stray dogs got euthanized or moved out of the area. But I knew that none of that had anything to do with what really happened. I live with the shame of not speaking up now every day, and I know that. Even though those boys were horrible people, it wasn't right what happened to them. And what happened to those stray dogs that just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time makes me feel even more guilty. That's why I'm in the Dogman Club, and that's why I've sworn to keep it secret till the day I die. Conclusion Thanks for letting us share our sort of secret origin stories. We also hope that this puts some ideas in some people's heads about finding other people with similar interests in their area to have a club with and share your mutual interests with just for the fun of it. Although the Dogman Club has so far just 
sat around and gabbed with each other. It might lead to a road trip someday or possibly some creative project. If not, then at least we've had fun with it. And I suppose in the end, that might be the main point of... <coughs> the Dogman Club. We're about to shoot off a water cannon to celebrate our new EP, Shannon. Please join us in welcoming our newest channel member, Shannon Nelson. Shannon gets to see our weekly Sunday Secret Uncensored stories, and so can you. The 1923 Dogman Diary Dear Scary Stories NYC I went urban exploring in an old hospital somewhere in northern Michigan back when I was, I guess, 16 or 18 and I snagged an old diary that I found in among the rubble in one of the rooms. It had this image of a wolf head on the front, which I thought looked cool. I flipped through it a bit and saw that there were plenty of empty pages in the back that I could draw on, so I tossed it in my bag to take with me. I also found a gray metallic wolf head carving or casting or something. It was three-dimensional and had a bit of heft to it. I figured it went with the diary, so I took it with me. When I got home, I nailed the little wolf head up on my wall, but the diary itself got stuck in a box to look at later and eventually found its way up to the attic. Fast forward to when I was 23. I had my first serious job and I was moving in with my girlfriend in a home we were renting at the edge of town near the woods. We could both catch a bus from there to our jobs, so it seemed convenient to us before we moved in at least. After moving in, we found out that it was kind of a spooky place to be. Since we were in our early 20s, we went with the vibe. We got tarot cards, we got a Ouija board, and I remembered that strange old wolf diary that I'd left in my parents' attic. I went home and fished it out, figuring it might look cool on a bookshelf or something. After I put it on display, my girlfriend Francine decided she would read it out loud to a small gathering of friends at a Halloween party we had that year. It turned out to be a lot more interesting than we had expected it to be. And so I'd like to send an edited version to you for possible use on your show. This is a Dogman story, so it should fit your format. And I hope it interests your audience. Without further ado, let's skip to the first relevant diary entry dated April 1923, 100 years ago this year. Dear Diary, I have never truly believed in my grandfather's prophecies. He's been blind for years and yet he claims to see things that we cannot. He has always been convinced that he has the power to look into the future and that his visions always come true. However, today was different. Today he foretold something that sent chills down my spine. My grandfather said that tomorrow, April 23rd, will be a momentous day for our family. He said that something important will happen that will shape our family's destiny for years to come. I have no idea what he meant by this prophecy. All I know is that my grandfather has never been wrong before, in his own opinion. He has claimed to always have been able to predict future events with unnerving accuracy. Some of his past predictions have been trivial, while a couple might be claimed to be life-changing. We all can't help but wonder what tomorrow holds for us. Could it be good news or bad? Is it something that we should prepare for something we should be afraid of. My mind is now consumed by thoughts of what could happen in the coming day. I know that I will not be able to sleep tonight. My grandfather's prophecy has filled me with both hope and dread. I can only pray that whatever happens tomorrow, it will be for the betterment of my family. Only time will tell. April 23rd, 1923, 12.09 a.m. I was woken up by a loud and frightening howl that seemed to come from outside. It sounded like no animal I'd ever heard before. I tried to brush it off and go back to sleep, but I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. 4 a.m. I was abruptly awakened by a crash of glass and a scream that pierced through the silence of the night. I immediately jumped out of bed and rushed to my sister's room. What I saw there will haunt me for the rest of my life. She was gone. Her bed was overturned, and the window was shattered. There were broken pieces of glass scattered all over the floor. 
and there was blood on the window frame. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was like a scene from a horror novel. At that moment, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. A creature that looked like a cross between a dog and a caveman was lurking outside the window. It was staring at me with piercing amber eyes. I froze in terror, unable to move or scream. The creature suddenly let out another ear-splitting howl and then disappeared into the darkness. I knew that my sister had been abducted by that thing. It was as if my grandfather's prophecy from the day before had come true. I am now sitting here in my room, my heart racing, and my mind unable to process what just happened. I don't know what to do or where to turn. All I know is that my sister is out there and she needs our help. I only hope we can find her before it's too late. April 23rd, 1923, 10 a.m. We've been searching the woods since early morning, hoping to find some trace of my sister. So far, there's been nothing. No signs of struggle or any indication of where she might have gone. I feel like we're running out of time. Whoever or whatever took her could be anywhere. And who knows what it wants. All we can do now is keep searching. 11.48 a.m. I can hardly believe what I'm seeing. My sister has just walked out of the woods, stumbling and dazed. We ran to her, and she collapsed into our arms unconscious. The relief and joy of seeing her alive are indescribable. We have so many questions, but for now, we need to focus on getting her help. She's badly injured, with bruises and cuts all over her body. We brought her inside and are waiting for the doctor to come to us. All we can do now is hope and pray for her recovery. Whatever she's been through, I cannot begin to imagine the horror she's faced. My heart breaks for her, and I can only hope that she can recover and heal in time. I will keep writing in this diary as the situation unfolds, but for now, I need to stay by my sister's side and offer whatever support I can. We will get to the bottom of this and figure out what happened, but for now, we need to focus on her recovery. April 23rd, 1923, 5 p.m. It has been a long and trying day. After discovering my sister June in a daze in the woods and bringing her home to her bed, we were relieved to find out that she was alive. However, the events that unfolded while she was bedridden left us all in shock. June woke up in her bed and started speaking of things that seemed completely out of this world. She claimed that she had been taken to an island, an island ruled by dog-headed men who didn't speak. According to June, these men had chosen her as their messenger of light and had taught her many things. I cannot explain the fear and confusion that gripped us when she spoke so strangely. It was almost as if something else had taken control of her mind. We tried to explain to her that it must have just been a dream, but she seemed adamant that what she said was very real. The doctor examined her and concluded that June was delirious and likely suffering from a severe case of shock. He gave her a potion to induce sleep and asked us to leave the room so that she could rest. As I sit here now, away from her bedside, I can scarcely comprehend what has happened. Everything seems surreal, and the world is almost like a dark, twisted nightmare. The events of today have left us all feeling vulnerable and exposed. We are searching for answers to questions that we never even thought to ask before. Why did June's abduction happen? Who are these dog-headed people that she speaks of? I don't know if we will ever get the answers to these questions, but one thing is for sure. We will do everything we can to keep our family safe. We cannot let anything like this ever happen again. But for now, we can only wait and hope that June recovers soon. I pray for her well-being and the strength to face whatever the future may hold. 
April 24th, 1923. Morning. I woke up to find my entire family was gathered around my sister June's bed. She was awake and had apparently told them all something that had left them speechless. When I asked what had shocked them, they told me that June had related a creation narrative in which the pagan jackal god Anubis had created both life and death. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This was a blasphemous notion, and I couldn't comprehend how anyone could believe in such things. After her abduction and everything else that had happened, I do not know how June could be saying such things. It seemed like she had fallen deeper into some kind of delusional state, and I despise it. I am worried about my sister's mental health and the influence of the pagan ideas that seem to have taken hold of her. As a Christian, these things go against everything that I believe and everything that I stand for. I will be speaking to the doctor about this when I get a chance. We cannot let such beliefs take root in our family. This is a time for faith and healing, not blasphemy and confusion. As I sit here and write this, I cannot help but wonder what the future holds. Will June's beliefs change? Will she recover from this ordeal? And if she does, will she ever return back to her normal self? All these questions continue to haunt me, but I'm determined to stay strong and to protect my family. We have already been through so much, and I'm determined not to let anything else bring us down. April 24th, 1923. Evening. Today has been a difficult day for our family. I am still struggling to understand what has happened. June continues to talk about her experiences on the supposed island and how she was chosen by the dog-headed men to be their messenger of light. However, tonight, she took it a step further and explained a new cosmic system in which humanity serves these dogmen. It all seems so surreal, and yet she speaks with such confidence and conviction that it's hard to know what is real and what is not. As she spoke, I saw the sadness and despair on the faces of my family members. We wept at the prospect of serving these foul beasts. The mere thought of it is too much to bear. I worry that June has been brainwashed by these creatures and that she might never return to being the person that we know and love. We cannot let the ideations of these beastly creatures control us. It's like we're living in a different world with a twisted reality. We cannot let our faith be undermined by these pagan beliefs. It's causing division and confusion in our family, which is a very dangerous thing in these troubled times. All I can do now is pray and hope that we get through this. I don't know what the future holds, but I will not give up hope. We will fight against these pagan beliefs, and we will try to bring June back to the fold. Tomorrow, I will speak to our local pastor and see if he can provide any guidance or help. We need to find a way to reconcile June's beliefs with our own, or we will all be lost. April 25th, 1923. Morning. I am still shaking from yesterday's events. After June's upsetting words, I decided to walk to our church and go have a conversation with our local pastor to see if he could provide any guidance or help on my sister's condition. But as soon as I entered that church, I felt a strange aura suffocating the atmosphere, an all-pervading stench of brimstone and sulfur. The pastor welcomed me into his office with a warm smile, and we sat down to talk. But as we spoke, something strange happened. The pastor's eyes turned black. His voice got deeper, and suddenly, the foul beast himself spoke through him. I looked at the pastor, but I saw the dogman, and that dog-headed creature declared that our town was unclean, and therefore the property of his master, the devil. I could barely believe what I was seeing and hearing, and I could not control my fear. Within seconds, the pastor returned to normal, and it was me who looked crazy as I ran out of that church in fear. I know now that June is not the only one possessed by these animalistic creatures 
They seem to be everywhere, waiting to claim us all. But I will not let them take me or my family. We will find a way to fight back and protect our town from this wickedness. I pledge to work with my fellow townspeople to protect and defend against this evil. We cannot let these creatures take over our beautiful town. I pray for strength and guidance as we navigate these dark times. We must stand united against the powers of darkness and fight back with all our might for a better tomorrow. Now there's no more entries until May 22nd, 1923, where it says, I apologize for not having recorded my thoughts sooner, but I have been consumed by remarkable visions of a shocking future that have left me reeling. Despite the disquieting nature of these insights, I cannot shake the conviction that they are, in some way, prophetic. In my visions, a world of machines that can think and act for humankind has come to pass. Such inventions have given rise to a future age in which man can efficiently serve their true masters who are the dogmen. These creatures that I once reviled have now been revealed to me in a new light as the benevolent beings who will guide humanity to its ultimate salvation and build us a world of enduring peace by the year 2030 should we only learn to be as obedient as they are. Their capacity for love, loyalty, and devotion has been my beacon of hope, and I've been awed by our exclusion of these creatures in the past centuries. We, the humans, have always been the lesser creatures to the canines. They have long been superior forms of life because they have the singular attribute, the element of loyalty and subservience that has been vital to their success not only as a species but outlasting entire civilizations. These ideas are not just born of my imaginings. They have a basis in history that has been masterfully hidden with knowledge and truths kept under lock and key inaccessible to normal myopic humans. But with the aid of the dogman's visions, the veil is lifted and the hidden truths have been revealed to me. In previous diary entries, I had documented my struggles about faith and beliefs, but all those qualms of the past have now dissipated in the light of the promised glory beyond the veil. Their knowledge is elder and everlasting, and that's why it is so far beyond our current comprehension. The wondrous knowledge that the dogmen possess upon this world is something that we humans can barely grasp. The greatness of their minds and their loyalty is unmatched in all creation. And to think we have ignored such a treasure for so long is unthinkable. Now that they have chosen us to be their devoted servants, we must open our minds, hearts, and souls. These visions are a blessing, and I will never forget the way they have shaken me to my very core, the path toward 2030 will require much trust, patience, and skill, as we will be called upon to learn how to serve the dogman in new ways of devotion. They will be the ones who will lead us to enlightenment, and inevitably, to peace. It is my duty to document this journey, the one that began with my sister's abduction and her revelation, and destined to build up the life of the gracious masters who had been waiting to kiss our ignorant existence with their great pups on us, their adoptive children. Fear and doubt no longer pervade me. They have been replaced with a sense of purpose and a feeling of acceptance. Under their guiding hand and teaching, we will emerge from these ages of disobedience and disobedient rebellion to create a new world of enlightenment dedicated to the needs of our canine masters. In 2030, by that date, the task would be done, and they will have been our supreme leaders, granting us a fulfilling world of order, purpose, and joy. A utopia long denied to us before their intervention, I fervently hope that man would be able to live up to its obligations and provide a new lease of life to their eternal masters.
I salute their grace and the wisdom of their vision. I am in their debt, and I willingly accept my new role as a servant of these blessed creatures. And the rest of the pages are blank. It's also got little flowers pressed between some pages and an illustration of what must have been the dogman's head, I guess. Creepy, huh? It was a big hit at our Halloween party. And one of our guests said that they were going to talk to someone in Hollywood about getting an option for a new movie franchise, but nothing ever came of that. Later, we got the diary appraised, and we were told it might be worth a couple hundred dollars, but nothing more. None of the individuals mentioned in the diary appear to be on the official record as having lived in that location during that era, although this was a hundred years ago, and some town records in that region were destroyed in not one but several fires over those ten decades. It is possible that these were real people, but since we can't establish that beyond a reasonable doubt, it limits the perceived resale value of the diary. So finally we figured we'd let you read it for your show, since we're both fans of what you do. Hope you and your viewers enjoyed as it was written down by hand. In The 1923 Dogman Diary Celebrating 31 months as a top tier member, that's over two years if you do the math. She's the tops from January to December, and I'm talking about our dear sweet, Kath. Please join me in thanking tonight's executive producer, Kathy Barrickman, for making this episode possible. Kathy, of course, is a very special person, one who we keep in our prayers all the time. We hope that you do the same. Thank you, Kathy, for everything you do. The Centaur Dogman Pub Dear Scary Stories NYC As I was strolling through the woods, I caught a glimpse of something unusual out of the corner of my eye. There was movement behind a bush. Curious, I approached to take a closer look. To my amazement, I saw a young, upright, silver and white dogman puppy munching on that bush's berries. Now I've heard tales of dogman, but to see one up close, was a completely different experience. I couldn't help but stare in wonder at this tiny creature with its soft fur and adorable puppy face. I thought about how much larger he might grow and wondered if he would be a six-footer or one of those twelve-footers. The thought of that sobered me up pretty quick as I looked around silently for the mama dogman. This one looked pretty young and it seemed quite likely to me that it might still be under adult supervision. I decided I'd better back away from the scene, but I carelessly stepped on a loud snapping twig in the process. All of a sudden, the puppy peeked out from behind the bush and caught sight of me, initially startled. It quickly regained its composure and trotted confidently toward me, tail wagging. As the younger dogman approached, I saw that it was no ordinary pup. As it drew closer, I noticed that its fur on top was silver but its bottom was a rich warm brown. And that's when I noticed that rich warm brown bottom had four legs. I had never seen anything quite like this before. I wondered how this dog man could be so unique and special. I was amazed at the difference between what I had imagined his body looked like as opposed to how it actually looked. And I could hardly believe my eyes. It was a young dog man pup who appeared to be a centaur dogman with four legs on the ground and two paws free to use for other things. I couldn't help but stop in my tracks and watch as he pranced around the clearing. I reached out a tentative hand toward the pup and I was pleased as it sniffed and then nuzzled against my fingers. It was a moment I will never forget and I feel privileged to have met such a remarkable creature. As I walked away from the pup, I couldn't help but smile, knowing that I was experiencing something truly special. The pup had the head of a dog, and a torso sort of like a human, but of course covered in soft fur. His legs were sturdy and muscular, ending in very large paws that allowed him to run and play with ease. As I approached him cautiously, the pup looked up at me with his big brown eyes and wagged his bushy tail. My first experience with that dogman pup was peaceful and gentle. He appeared to be happy and carefree, 
chasing his tail and frolicking through the forest. I remember feeling a sense of awe and wonder, as if I were experiencing something truly magical. Sometimes when I tell people this story, they stare at me blankly, and then I realize that the word centaur isn't exactly one that's used by everyone every day. So to give you some perspective on how surprised I was by what I was seeing and petting, you should probably first know what a centaur is. The centaur is a creature from Greek mythology that has the upper body of a human and the lower body of a horse. They are typically depicted as wild and barbaric, wielding bows and arrows, and engaging in battles or other violent activities. They were seen as a symbol of the duality between civilization and nature, with their half-human, half-horse form, representing the struggle between man's rational mind and his primal instincts. Centaur mythology figures prominently in many Greek legends and myths. One of the most well-known stories involving centaurs is that of the wedding of Perithus, a human king, and Hippodamia, a daughter of Zeus. During the wedding feast, the centaurs became drunk and unruly, attempting to abduct the bride and inciting a violent skirmish. This story is often used to symbolize the tension between civilization and savagery, as well as the dangers of excessive drink and debauchery. Another famous centaur legend is that of Chiron, one of the few peaceful and wise centaurs. According to the myth, Chiron was a revered teacher and healer who mentored many famous Greek heroes, including Achilles and Jason. However, he was eventually struck with a poison arrow and could not heal himself, leading him to sacrifice his immortality in exchange for the release of Prometheus, a titan who had been punished by Zeus. Despite their enduring popularity in Greek mythology, there is no real evidence to suggest that centaurs ever existed. The idea of a creature with the body of a horse and the intelligence and personality of a human seems to be purely fictional and cannot be reconciled with our current understanding of biology and evolution. Nonetheless, the image of the centaur has captivated the imaginations of people for centuries and remains a beloved figure in mythology and fantasy literature. So now you know what a centaur is. Now imagine that, but smaller, cuter, and canine, and you should get the picture. After my initial sighting, I made it a point to keep an eye out for the dogman pup whenever I was in the woods. You would have too. On my second sighting, I came across him playing with a group of squirrels. They seemed to be his friends, and he was content to chase them around without causing them any harm. This got me to wondering what the dogman pup was eating, if he made friends with his potential prey. The third time I saw the dogman pup, I noticed that he had grown stronger and more agile. He was now able to climb trees like a squirrel and jump over logs and other obstacles with ease, using his powerful legs and paws to propel himself effortlessly. You know, as for his parents, I could only speculate as to where they might be. I always looked around for them, but I never saw any other dogman with him, ever. I suppose it's possible that they were keeping a watchful eye on him from a distance, allowing him to explore the world on his own. Or perhaps they had abandoned him altogether, leaving him to fend for himself in the wild. Whatever the case, I felt grateful to have had the chance to witness such a remarkable creature, and I vowed to always keep an eye out for him in the future. I got in the habit of making bologna sandwiches and bringing them with me on my walks. It was mainly supposed to be for the dogman centaur, but I didn't see him for a while, so I developed a taste for plain bologna on white bread. Then one sunny day, in a meadow, under the tranquil blue sky, I noticed a cute and fuzzy creature playing joyfully. As I approached this creature, I noticed it to be the centaur dogman puppy, and I grew excited. His body below the waist was that of a cute little puppy that wagged its tail in excitement. The puppy's hindquarters had a short, caramel-colored fur with a swishy tail. He was happily galloping around, stopping every now and then to sniff at the flowers in the field. The puppy's muscular arms and paws were covered in thick silver fur, while his head was similar to that of a silver German shepherd, sporting cute ears and a long snout. With an adorable gaze, he looked straight at me, 
seeming to be delighted and inviting me to play with him. The puppy was blissfully frolicking around in the meadow, wagging its tail and sniffing at everything that caught its interest. It was eagerly waiting for me to engage in playful activity, and I felt myself drawn to the creature's friendly and happy nature. Seeing a centaur dogman puppy was a truly unique and unforgettable experience. I tossed him some of a bologna sandwich, and he caught it in his mouth. I repeated the effort, and so did he, until he had scarfed the entire thing down. I felt better knowing that he had gotten a little protein inside of him, even if he did make friends with all the small game. I began to seriously think that maybe I should bring him home. As I pondered the idea, I couldn't help but think that something was missing from my life. I craved companionship, but the thought of taking care of another living being was a daunting one. I had never owned a pet before, even a normal one. So obviously the idea of taking in a feral cryptid seemed like a huge responsibility. But after careful consideration, I realized that the pros of bringing the centaur dogman pup home far outweigh the cons. On one hand, owning a pet brings immense joy and companionship. They become like family members, but in a good way. And the bond that we share with them is unique and unbreakable. A pet can provide us with unconditional love and support in both good times and bad. They are our loyal companions and can even improve our physical and mental health. Studies have shown that pet owners have lower blood pressure and experience less stress and anxiety. However, sharing your home with a wild baby cryptid comes with its fair share of cons, too. Taking care of it can be a handful. It requires patience and dedication, as they need to be trained and kept away from people. Owning a cryptid also means additional expenses such as food, and you need to find a veterinarian who won't report you to the feds. It can also limit your freedom as you have to be responsible for their needs at all times, unless you want them killing the neighbor's pets for food, or the neighbor's. When deciding whether to take in an untrained centaur dogman as a pet, I think there are a few important factors to consider. First and foremost, you need to ensure that you have the time and resources to take care of them properly. This includes providing a safe and comfortable living environment, regular meals and exercise, and medical care when needed. You should also consider your lifestyle and whether owning a feral six-legged dog monster is feasible for you. Some pets require more time and attention than others. Ultimately, the decision to take in a feral untrained cryptid is a personal one. It's important to consider all the pros and cons and weigh them against your personal circumstances. While it may seem daunting at first, the reward of a loyal companion outweighs many challenges. For me, taking in an untrained pet was the best decision I ever made. The love and joy that they brought to my life was priceless. So for me personally, when I added up one side, it outweighed the other by a whole lot. I never thought I would be the type of person to take in a wild animal, let alone a six-legged dogman. But when I saw that cute little centaur pup frolicking around in the field, I couldn't help myself. I knew it was going to be a challenge, but I was up for it. I broke up pieces of bologna and tossed them behind me, ensuring the little monster would follow me home. As I led the puppy back to my house, I made note of the fact that its behavior was very similar to that of a regular dog. It wagged its tail excitedly, jumped up on me for attention, and licked my face lovingly. I had a new furry friend, but with a unique twist, as this puppy could stand on four legs and still use his front arms. Over the next few weeks, I learned that the puppy was also like a horse in several unexpected ways. It had a powerful gait when running, was able to kick with impressive force, and enjoyed eating from a feeding trough. It was fascinating to watch the puppy move and interact with me and the environment in ways that no other animal could. However, what was most interesting to me were the ways in which the puppy was like a human child. It had an incredibly inquisitive nature and loved exploring its surroundings, 
constantly asking silent questions with his big expressive eyes. It was like having a little person in the house. The puppy was also incredibly emotional and showed us happiness in ways that should be familiar to most people who've ever had a pet. It wasn't always easy. The puppy was a handful and required a lot of attention, love, and patience. However, with each passing day, I grew more and more attached to this incredible little guy. It was a never-ending experience of amusement and discovery, and the puppy never failed to amaze me with its unique personality. That centaur dogman puppy was like a dog in its loving and social behavior, but was like a horse in its impressive physical strength and agility, but also like a human child in its inquisitive emotional nature and need for care and attention. It was a journey, but one that I'm extremely grateful to have taken. One summer day, I decided to take the puppy and my neighbor's pony out for a run in the fields to burn off some energy. As soon as the puppy caught sight of that pony, it let out a happy bark and began to gallop toward it. At first I was slightly worried as the puppy was much smaller than the pony and I didn't want it to get hurt. However, that puppy was quick and nimble and seemed to thrive and seemed to thrive on the competition. They started off slowly, circling each other before breaking out into a run. The puppy managed to keep up with that pony using its powerful hind legs to leap forward at a great speed. Its arms flailed excitedly as it sprinted alongside the larger equine. It was an impressive sight to behold, a wild dogman centaur puppy racing a pony, their manes and fur flying in the wind, with the sun reflecting off their shiny coats. The puppy was fearless, darting in and out of the pony's path with jaw-dropping agility. For a few moments, they were neck and neck, but eventually, the sheer power and size of the pony took over, and it bolted ahead, leaving that puppy playing catch-up. Despite not winning the race, the puppy was overjoyed with the experience, wagging its tail furiously, panting excitedly, and barking playfully at that pony. It was amazing to see how much enjoyment and satisfaction these animals could derive from something as simple as a run through the meadows. After they had settled down, the puppy came bounding over to me, tongue lolling out of its mouth, happy and tired. It was another unforgettable experience, and one of many exciting times that I spent with this extraordinary creature. As the puppy grew bigger and stronger, I realized it was time to build a stable for it to rest in at night. I knew a regular doghouse would not be sufficient for this unique animal. So I set to work constructing a wooden stable with a fenced yard for it to play in while I was at work or away. The stable was sturdy, spacious, and had everything the puppy could need to be happy and comfortable. It had a feeding trough, a water barrel, and a soft bed filled with hay. I spent a whole weekend building this stable, and I was proud of how it turned out. However, as soon as I introduced the puppy to its new home, it became apparent that he did not like it there. Despite the comfortable bed and the numerous toys, it was clear he preferred staying by my side, inside my house. One night, the puppy's discontent reached a peak. I had retired to bed, and I thought the puppy had settled in its new stable. But it wasn't long before those thoughts were interrupted by loud galloping sounds. It was the puppy who had broken out of its stable and was now running around my house. I rushed outside, only to find that the strong and determined puppy had already completely trashed that stable. As I examined the destruction, I looked up to see the puppy with its arms crossed, standing with pride and stubbornness. It was then that I realized that it was really like a human child. The puppy wanted to be indoors, which was something I had not anticipated. It was clear my construction skills were good, but my forward thinking and planning needed improvement, at least when it came to this special little guy. From then on, the stable remained empty, and the puppy stayed indoors with me at night. It was a minor adjustment for me, but after all, the puppy had brought so much joy and happiness into my life. I was eager to accommodate his wishes and 
Create a space that he felt safe and comfortable in. It was a small price to pay for having such an extraordinary companion by my side. I kept the puppy on my property at all times, hiding him from the public, because I wasn't sure it was legal to even own him. I didn't know if his odd body type would help or hurt him in the wild, and I just wanted to make sure he got to live a full life. I didn't want him to be exploited as a freak in show business or anything like that. So I figured he was better off living in secret with me than with anyone who would treat him like a meal ticket. I tried to treat him as my friend, and that is what I thought he had become. But a dogman is still a wild animal, not a house pet. And that's even more true for a centaur dogman. As this pup grew, that became more apparent and impossible to ignore. Time went on, and it really sunk in that my little centaur pup was not exactly a normal dog. He was getting bigger and stronger, with an agility and energy that seemed almost otherworldly. Sometimes he would disappear for hours, running through the woods or chasing after some scent that only he could smell. And sometimes when he came back, he would be covered in dirt and blood, his fur matted and tangled. At first I didn't mind, though. I thought it was just part of his wild nature, and I loved him all the same. But as he grew older, things started to change. He became more aggressive, snarling and growling at strangers who came to the door, or barking ferociously at the same squirrels and birds that used to be his playmates in his youth. He got to the point where he would become aggressive with me, and look at me with eyes that were no longer friendly. I began to fear for my own safety around my own beloved friend. It broke my heart, but I knew that I could not keep the centaur dogman any longer. And so, with a heavy heart, I made the decision to let him go. I found a wildlife sanctuary that specialized in caring for dogmen, and I decided to bring him there. He had always loved riding in the car with me before. But this time he just stood there looking at me, with eyes filled with suspicion and disappointment. As I tried to get him into the back seat, he bolted and ran for the woods. He didn't look back, and I haven't seen him again. I think I cried for ten days. My centaur dogman is still wild and untamed, but now he is happy and free. He runs through the woods, no doubt, chasing after prey and howling at the moon. And I know that, even though I can no longer hold him in my arms, I will always have a place in my heart for the centaur dogman. He's a nice guy, not a scutch. I'm talking about our EP Butch. Please join me in thanking Butch Rudrick for making this episode possible. Butch donated to us using our handy dandy thanks button, sending us a super thanks. He also donates in other ways and gets perks for it. You can too. My pet dogman went feral. Dear Scary Stories NYC. I am a woman in my 40s who is only now beginning to put the pieces together from some stuff that happened to me back when I was in my 30s. I used to live with a guy that I loved, and the two of us got to keep a secret dogman pet that nobody in the world knew about except us. It was a pretty nice life, and I miss it now. Everything fell apart after our pet dogman went feral on me one day out of the blue. That's not to say that I blame the dogman for the incident. I feel guilt about the entirety of this, but it takes a minute to explain it all. So grab yourselves a beverage or a bowl of popcorn and settle in. I'm going to call my ex Brad because he was kind of buff, but also kind of nerdy, like Brad in Rocky Horror. He even wore thick frame glasses while he worked out in his personal gym room. Brad lived out in the country but I was a city girl. I liked it that it was a bit hard for us to get together, so this way I could see other guys in addition to Brad and not have to tell any of them about any of the others. After we had been seeing each other for almost a full year, Brad invited me to move out to live in his home. I said no right off the bat, but then he clarified that he wanted me to live there rent-free. 
I had been living in Green Bay and working one job after another, with none of them leading to anything better. In fact, I was making less and working more as time went on. When Brad invited me out, he told me that he'd pay for my necessities, and if I needed spending cash, there were crappy jobs such as I was used to, within driving distance. So the money I'd been trying to subsist off of would now just be my pocket change. I started moving in before answering his question about whether I wanted to. In fact, I was asking him where I should unpack before he finished asking me if I wanted to move in. At least once I understood the terms of the arrangement. You know, I had been questioning whether I loved Brad enough to move in with him. But I no longer cared whether it was true love or not once I got that offer. Love shmove. I was cold and hungry. Over time, I got used to my new life. And by over time, I mean instantly. Brad enjoyed running errands for me and getting me treats. The house had its own movie theater in the basement with a nice projector and surround sound. It had an outdoor jacuzzi with a roof that would put itself up with the push of a button. It was also heated in the winter and air-conditioned in the summer on that deck. Brad had a wine cellar on the same level as the movie theater. He had a chef staff on call 24-7. And my ex had some very exotic pets. There was a private zoo with creatures whose names I can't pronounce. But inside his home, he kept exotic fish, a fancy bird that talked, and... Now here's the part you'll be most interested in. A dog that walked around on its hind legs like a human being. This wasn't the tallest dogman, and it wasn't the most muscular dogman, but it was a dogman, all right. I asked Brad straight off, is that a dogman? And he laughed and said, yeah, that's a dogman. I mean, what else could it be? The dog guy walked around the house like it was his natural habitat. He was so cute, walking around like he was Rory Calhoun or something. I made friends with him straight off. I had always heard of the dogman but I pictured him being a lot scarier. This guy liked to chase frisbees. He liked to catch milk bone dog biscuits that I would throw in the air. He was like a really fun dog, but he was also like a perfect little gentleman. At least, that was my first impression of him. I hadn't seen him with a reason to be upset yet, though. Brad seemed content to feed me bonbons until I got huge, so I figured I'd get myself a little day job as an excuse not to eat the fattening food that he filled that luxury house with every waking second. I could use the extra money for my own food and makeup. Plus, I had never stayed with just one guy for so long before, and I was feeling kind of frisky. I knew that Brad was seeing other women back when we first started dating, so I just assumed he still was. Plus, I didn't see why he would be upset with me if I played the field. I mean... What if I found someone who would be a better provider for me, right? He wouldn't deny me that, would he? I don't know. It's hard to explain, but it all made sense to me at the time. I started seeing this guy for a while we can call Rocky. He was sort of a bad boy type. He wore leather and rode a Harley when I wasn't riding him. I think I met him at a McDonald's, so I knew from the start that he was going to be a keeper. One night when I had been partying extra hard with Rocky, I was feeling so universally friendly that I decided why not invite Rocky home to meet my sugar daddy and my sugar doggy. Again, this made lots of sense to me at the time. It didn't make sense to Brad or to Rory Calhoun the dogman either. When Rocky and I staggered in the front door that night, laughing hard and trying to help each other stand up, Brad threw a fit got all moralistic on us. The guy who owned his own wine cellar was going to judge us for partying a little before we drove home. I mean, I know technically it isn't legal to do that and you could get yourself killed, but we were feeling good that night, you know? Until Brad harshed our mellow, I mean. I had never seen him get so freaked out before. He kicked Rocky and me both out. And he told me that I had to sober up before I could come back and pick my stuff up to move out. He uninvited me from staying there in my own home. From breakfast in bed to evicted, just like that. You'd have thought I punched his mother in the throat or something. 
So while Brad and I were yelling at each other, Rocky just drove off without me. Like I said before, Brad's house is way, way, way out of town. So I was sort of suddenly in a very bad situation. I was either going to need to borrow his car or ask for a lift if I was going to go anywhere. Things got significantly worse when that dogman walked up behind Brad, showing me his teeth and glaring at me like he'd never seen me before. That made me feel so sad. It also made me feel very nervous, since the idea of that big upright walking canine trailing me through that area at night was truly terrifying. In the light, he looked like a big strong animal, but at night, with his glowing eyes, he looked like some kind of hell monster from outer space. I really messed up the day I got that dogman sore at me. But the dogman wasn't the only one furious at me. Brad was looking at me with hate as well. All of that, mixed with the malt liquor, got me to feeling weepy. I started crying and saying it wasn't fair. Because Brad had never told me that we were supposed to be exclusive with each other. At first he was incredulous. Like, how could you think I would want you living here but dating other guys? But then he remembered. It's me. So he thought maybe my head really was that far up my own behind that I would think he wanted me to date other guys. And soft-hearted Brad decided to give me one more chance. He told the dog man to stand down. But I don't think that creature ever really did. The dog man wanted me gone. And he felt I was a threat to his master. In some ways, the dogman was the smartest of the three of us. Things weren't the same from then on with me and old Rory the dogman. He would sniff me all over when I arrived. But now it felt more like I was going through a body inspection at the border or something. The smiling face he used to give me was replaced with a suspicious one. He never relaxed when I was in the house ever again after that. This led to a tenseness among us two humans as well, although we would both deny it. Finally, Brad announced to me that he was going to take the dogman with him on a trip up north and let me have the house to myself for a couple of weeks. That seemed like a great way for us to all let off some steam. When I went to work that morning, I knew I'd get to have the whole place to myself when I got back that night, and it felt like a huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders. It was becoming more uncomfortable each night with that dogman giving me these looks and making me feel both guilty and unsafe at the same time. The idea that I could finally let my guard down and be myself after work was like an excitement injection, and I was in an awesome mood. So I went out dancing in town to celebrate, and guess who I ran into at my third or fourth bar? That's correct, my old friend Rocky. And of course I took him home with me. Or rather I had him take me home with him, but to my place, not his. Well, to Brad's place, but Brad wasn't going to be home, and neither was the dogman. So that made it my place for the night, and every night, of the next two weeks. Except when we got to the house, both Brad and his guard dog man were still inside. We never got as far as talking about why they were still there. To this day, I don't know if their ride was delayed or if the whole thing was just a trap to test how faithful I was. Well, I know it doesn't look good, but I swear I was about to make Rocky sleep on the couch. I just didn't want him to have to worry about a place to sleep that night or something. I remember I had a noble reason for having him there. Even if I can't remember specifically what that reason was exactly. Well, the thing I most feared was now coming true. The dogman chased me back out of that house and into the dark night out in the country. When I would stop and plead with him, he would lunge at me so that I would run away. The creature would trot after me, holding back a bit and keeping his distance, but charging every now and then to get me to squeal and kick it back into high gear for a while. I would look back in the dark night, and even when I couldn't see the dogman himself, I could see his eyes glowing in the pitch black. 
I cried like a baby, and I begged for mercy, but I knew he would see no reason to give me either. I had such a good arrangement with Brad, and I had thought that the dog man loved me too. I could sort of understand Brad misunderstanding the situation, but it was such a miscarriage of fairness that this canine man now felt he was in a position to pass judgment on me. Aren't men supposed to look out for women? So why was I being chased by a disloyal animal through my own neighborhood as though I had done something wrong? All I did was bring a guy home that I was partying with. It was Brad's fault that he didn't leave the place to me the way he promised me that he would. It doesn't seem to me that I'm the one who broke a promise here. Besides, aren't dogs supposed to be our best friends? This one turned psycho on me, and as a dog, he owed me far better treatment than that. I would sometimes feed him at night, you know. And the way I see it, that means the dogman owed me some loyalty. Instead, I had to taste his nasty dog breath on my neck, making me keep running through the darkness, crying, not even sure where I was going in the night. The ground got softer and I found it hard to walk in my party shoes. I broke a nail grabbing a tree for balance, and the dogman's growling began to sound louder and more impatient behind me. Things were not going my way. I couldn't see any more trees around me, and it dawned on me that I was walking out into a field of some sort when I heard what was either a cow or a bull off to my right. I realized I had walked into grassland, being grazed by huge bovines. If the dogman or I spooked these cows, we could easily end up either trampled to death or gored alive. I looked around for the trees, hoping to retreat into them, but the night was so dark, the only things I could see were the stars and the moon up over my head. Guessing at the direction back to the woods, I took a couple of unsure steps that way, only to be met by a sudden bark from the dogman. I could feel the ground tremble under my feet as the bovines around us in the blackness began to stampede. They shouted and moaned and whined, each one in their own way, as terror overtook the herd. Then they ran, as one. Would they run me over? Or would they run away from me? Was I safer staying put? Or should I be running for cover myself? If so, what direction should I go? In the darkness with my adrenaline pumping, I did not have the answer to any of those questions. But I knew that if I ran forward, I would run straight into the dogman that caused this stampede. Taken over by instincts, I ran in a random direction. Well... I started to run, that is. But I stepped in a big, messy pile of someone's poo. And I slid so far and fast down a wet hill of that stuff that I thought I was going tobogganing in the dark. I kept trying to get up and slipping back down again. It was a disaster of untold proportions. I smelled so bad, I had never been so humiliated. And I knew that next would come the savage attack from the dogman. I had no doubt that this was how my life was going to end. And so I resigned myself to my fate. I decided that rather than wait for the end to come, I would get up and walk back uphill as well as I could, climbing up through the nasty smelling earth and whatever else. I climbed and hiked. Two steps forward, three steps back, until it dawned on me that I hadn't heard the dogman for a while. Maybe I smelled too nasty for him to want to stick around. Maybe I was alone out there in that cow field. At least I hadn't gotten trampled to death. My hope began to return until the dawn finally began to shed some light on the subject. Washing myself in a stream that morning, I was seen by a fisherman who took me in and dried my clothing for me. We were instant lovers, which for some reason caused Brad and the dogman to become even more unhappy with me. I swear I will never understand men. You try to be nice to them, 
but all they do is get jealous and sick their dog man on you. Still, when I think back on those days, I feel as though those were my happiest times. In spite of the toxicity of both Brad and his animal friend, I think I would definitely give them another chance should the situation arise. Of course, I'm kind of assuming that they've grown more mature in terms of their expectations in a relationship by now. Just because someone moves in, that doesn't mean you're married to them or whatever. Also, first thing we do once I'm back in the house is take that dogman to get some training. He needs to respond to me as his master, just the same as he would to Brad. No more chasing me into piles of cow dung at night. And no more giving me looks that make me feel guilty if I slip up and start dating other guys again. If that creature doesn't want to be my friend any more than fine, he could be my obedient pet. He could follow the orders of his mistress. I am willing to move back in with Brad and his dogman that I used to call Rory. But things will obviously have to change. I will need assurances that I won't be judged so harshly. And I think I know how to guarantee myself more respectful treatment, too. If I am not taken back by July 4th of this year, then on July 5th, I will release to this channel the videotape I have of Rory the Dogman walking on his hind legs and using his paws as hands, sort of. He's able to pick up many things, but his hands are really still large paws, and I couldn't exactly call them hands. At any rate, whether you understand what I mean or not, I know Brad comprehends my message. I deserve to be paid back for my suffering, and I deserve to move back to my home with my family. I also deserve an apology, and lots of other things. But I'm willing to be open-minded and negotiate how much compensation would mitigate my suffering. But first and foremost on the list is that I get that dogman retrained to be loyal to me. Otherwise, I'm going public with proof of his existence before the summer's over. That's the choice that Brad has in his lap. How do you think he should decide? What would you decide? It's amazing how complicated things got when my pet dogman went feral. Butch Rudrick sent us a super thanks to keep us walking on our plank. I'm not sure what that's supposed to mean, but it rhymes, and therefore it was exactly what needed to be said. You know, Butch Rudrick supports us in so many ways, including being a channel member and getting to see our secret uncensored stories. In this case, he sent us a super thanks donation through YouTube, and we can't thank him enough. You can donate to us in various ways, or I guess uh, two or three ways. My Dogman Pup is a champion basketball player. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I recently came across your channel and was thrilled to see that you're interested in unique stories. Well, do I have a story for you. A little while back, I acquired a puppy that could do something incredible. Not only could he walk on two legs, but he dominated the game of basketball like no other. His name was Buddy. In fact, it still is. And when he was a young puppy, he was absolutely amazing on the court. But he had a way of sneaking up on unsuspecting opponents and robbing the ball right out from underneath them. It was like he had a sixth sense for where the ball was going to go. And he would always find a way to get there first. The best part was that he did it all while walking on his hind legs. He would strut up to the ball like he owned the place. And the human players would be in disbelief at what they were seeing. This was like something out of a movie. I remember one time we were playing fetch at the park. And there was a group of teenagers who were playing a game of keep away. Buddy walked right up to them, leaped in the air over their heads, and stole the ball. The look on their faces was priceless. Needless to say, Buddy quickly became the talk of the park. People would come from all around just to watch him play. Watching him dominate a game of b-ball was truly something special. And he was becoming known in the neighborhood, just north of Detroit that we were living in at the time. One day, one guy came over to me acting all hush-hush. He told me that my dog was no ordinary dog, 
He insisted that I had a dangerous animal and that the government was going to figure that out sooner or later and take him away from me. He told me I should sell him the dog for $2,000 cash and let him handle the headaches. I thought the guy was crazy, and so I just walked away from him. But every single day after that that I was outside with Buddy, this guy was there, upping his offer. When he reached ten grand, I asked him outright why he thought a puppy was worth $10,000. He looked me right in the eye and told me that I was in possession of a Michigan dog man. Well, that blew my mind. And I thought back on the odd circumstances that led to Buddy moving in with me. What happened was this. I had been planning this camping trip in northern Michigan for months. I wanted to disconnect from the hustle and bustle of city life and immerse myself in the tranquility of nature. What I didn't expect was the furry little surprise that greeted me on the first night of my trip. I was sitting by the campfire, enjoying the peaceful silence, when I heard some rustling in the bushes nearby. I wasn't sure what it could be, so I got up to investigate. And that's when I saw him, a small, brown, scruffy German Shepherd puppy that was somehow walking up on its hind legs. He wasn't just any ordinary puppy, that's for sure. From the moment he stepped out of the bushes on his hind legs, he strutted towards me with a pimp walk that said, I own this place. I couldn't help but laugh as I watched him make himself comfortable in my camping chair, barking at me as if to say, Hey, bring me some food. This little guy was adorable, with fluffy fur and big eyes that looked up at me expectantly. I couldn't help but smile as he waddled over to me, his little tail wagging excitedly. At first I figured he must belong to someone nearby, so I started calling out for his owners. Nobody responded. It was just me and this tiny puppy alone in the wilderness. I knew I should be wary of befriending a wild animal, especially one that might have man-eating parents, but it was hard not to fall in love with this little guy. Over the next few days, I did my best to take care of the puppy. I shared my food with him, and we spent our days exploring the woods together. He was a little ball of energy, always bouncing around, and licking my face. I enjoyed his company, but I knew that it was dangerous to get too close to wild animals, and I suspected that was exactly what he might be. As much as I wanted to keep him, I also knew that he needed to be with his family. I decided to leave my campsite and start looking for any signs of other dogs or people nearby. It was a risky move, but I felt it was the right thing to do. As I hiked through the wilderness, my mind raced with all sorts of possibilities. What if there were dangerous animals nearby? What if the puppy belonged to a pack of wolves or coyotes? I never imagined that a cute little puppy could be so potentially dangerous. Looking back on the experience, I realized just how fortunate I was. The dangers of befriending wild animals are real, and it's important to respect their space and boundaries. While my story seems to have a happy ending at least so far, things could have easily gone very wrong. As my camping trip wore on, I continued to watch this little puppy as he got into all sorts of mischief. He chased after fireflies, he dug holes in the dirt, and he even tried to steal my shoes. The little guy was fearless, and I couldn't help but admire his spunk. The next morning I woke up to find the puppy curled up next to me in my tent. It was clear he had no intention of leaving my side, and I didn't really mind one bit. We spent the rest of our last day exploring the woods together. I couldn't help but laugh at how much trouble this little guy got into. He chased after squirrels, he jumped in lakes, and he even tried to chew on a dead fish that I took away from him. It wasn't long before I knew that I had to take this little guy home with me. Even though we had only spent a few days together, it felt like we had bonded in a way that couldn't be explained. When it came time to pack up my camping gear and head back home, I knew that I couldn't leave him behind. The more I thought about it, the more I thought that the mysterious stranger offering me all that money must be right. I must have a rare cryptid puppy, and I needed to face up to that fact. The sooner the better. 
I contacted my uncle who keeps wild animals that used to be used in scientific experiments. He's agreed to let me and Buddy stay with him so that he can study how a dog man grows. It's all hush-hush now. He wants to wait until he has years of research to back him up before he announces to the world that the dog man is real after all. For now, Buddy and I have our own apartment on the compound, though we are aware that eventually he might be too large and too dangerous a predator to continue to live with me as my pet. There may come a time when he needs to be given his own enclosure, and I will no longer be able to spend as much time with the guy who's become my best friend in the world. I feel good about the fact that we not only have a plan in place to keep me and Buddy together for as long as we can, but we also have contingency plans for if he becomes too dangerous to share an apartment with at some point in the future. My uncle says that may never happen. In spite of his great strength and power, the beast may develop a personality like a human being and may never become violent. We might already have spoiled him to the point where he might never become a true hunter and might never really be able to fend for himself in the wild, even if he grows up into being one of those 12-footers I hear about from time to time. Now, as I write this, the little puppy who once acted like he was the boss of the campsite is curled up at my feet. It's been a few months since our little adventure in the woods, but it feels like we've been together for a lifetime. I may have gone on this trip seeking solitude, but instead, I found a new best friend. Thank you for taking the time to read my story, and try to remember that every single animal you meet has a soul, just like yours, even the people who vote differently than you do. Best regards, Name Redacted. Scary Stories is the place to be, thanks to nice people like Chris C. Well, as good as things were going for this channel back in December, that's how cold and harsh it's gotten for us now that the weather's warming up. YouTube is back to suppressing the channel, trying to get us to quit for whatever reason that makes sense to the poor addle-brained oligarchy. We can't expect them to make sense after so many generations of inbreeding anyway, so we're just gonna have to work around them. We can't stay online without the kind help of you, our viewers. In this case, Chris C who is a member of our channel several times over, donated even more additional funds to us using YouTube's handy dandy thanks button, which is located under each of our YouTube videos. You can use it too. And here to explain how is our international TV spokesmongrel, Henry Lee Dogman. Hank? Thanks, Biggie. And thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or Join our PayPal Subscribers Club at PeterBernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 Lascari. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after I think three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Scary, scary, scary stories. stories.